Get your Bibles open or your phones or iPads ready. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. I do want to start with something on the introduction today. Something about the book of Hebrews that really stirs up, it really stirs up critics. It really stirs up the enemy because this book is all about Jesus. And one of the things that it seemingly does quite often is stir up theological arguments about who Jesus really is. Remember, that's the whole crux of Christianity. If you do not believe Jesus is God, you're not a true Christian. And there are plenty of scriptures to back that up. And the doctrine of the Trinity and all those things. So we're going to talk about that today. But I told you this book is all about Jesus. It's about his divinity, his glory, his priesthood. It's about his place and his position on the throne of heaven. We were talking about this before church. You know, whenever you're struggling or going through any issues in life, um, it's funny because uh, the guy I was talking to said, you know, I checked this morning. Jesus is still on the throne. He's still on the throne in heaven, so I don't have to worry. And that's a great thing, and that's a great thing to re be reminded of. But I also want us to be reminded that the Trinity is a true doctrine of Christianity. It's accepted by faith. It's accepted by faith. I'll talk a little more about that today. But it's one of those things that it's accepted by faith. You're not going to be able to figure it out. I touched on it, and I told you that many men in their arrogance and in their ignorance, because they can't fully understand an infinitely dimensional God, they create these things. They create, they create God in their own image. They make God a man so they can figure him out. But here's the thing I want us to figure out or think about. You know, we live in, most of us live in at least three dimensions, I'm hoping. Um, possibly four, if you're walking in the spirit. Uh, they say there are as many as 12 we can, we can ascertain. I don't know how they came with that conclusion. But here's the thing. Even if you could live in all 12 dimensions that we think are uh, available, God is infinitely dimensional. How is a finite being who lives in so few dimensions going to understand a God who is infinitely dimensional? The truth is, you won't this side of heaven, and probably not even that side. That's why he's God. And so here's the thing. A lot of these arrogant people say, you know, I've created this theolo theological box, and I put God in it, and that's who he is. And that's what we see all over the place. But as we study the passages in Scripture that tell us about the triune nature, about the Trinity... Again, we have to accept it in faith. The only other alternative is we reject it in ignorance or in arrogance. There's no other option, by the way. You can get mad at me or you can test it. The truth of the matter is, if you know the scripture, if you've ever studied the scripture honestly, you know there's overwhelming evidence for the triune nature of God. And again, it requires faith to believe. And it starts with this. This is one thing I want to talk about because this is another thing I've seen um, a lot lately, especially when I teach through Hebrews, it seems. I get a lot of people coming out of the woodwork, critics, internet, you know, email, all these things. They want to test, they want to tell us that we can't really trust the word of God. You see, to understand the doctrine of the Trinity or any other doctrine of the Bible, we must first understand that the scriptures God breathed, it's inerrant. It's his word, it's perfect, it's infallible. He breathed it. Remember, he used over 40 different men over 1,500 years on three different continents. It's his word. And here's the secondary thing. We need to also believe that God is so big and he is so wonderful that he can protect his word. See, this is what the cults try to do. This is what others try to do, tear down the word of God. And it's nothing new, you know. It's nothing new. But I want to, I want to say this. Unlike other so-called holy books, our book has not been changed or altered. All these other holy books, these religious books, they've been altered thousands upon thousands of times. Some 100,000 times with the variants, the little things. And why? Because of contradictions and utter nonsense written within their pages. Because not only that, they have obvious errors and even plagiarism. Thousands of words of plagiarism. And they claim they're holy books. I just want to remind us of some key things why we can trust the Bible. Number one, all the fulfilled prophecies in Scripture. Just of the first coming of Christ. No other book can do that. No other book says this is what's going to happen and then it happens. Fulfilled prophecy is one of the key indicators of why we know we can trust the word of God. Another is the archaeological discoveries. All over Levant, the Middle East, all over that area, we have cities, we have regions, we have areas, we have proof of battles. We have archaeological evidence, historical evidence that blows away any other religion. It's accurate. There are several religions that don't even have maps in the back of their holy, you know, so-called holy books because their places don't exist. Ours do. Not only that, the internal consistency of the scripture. It never contradicts. I told you, all these authors, but it's really one author. 
Over 1,500 years, three different continents, yet it never contradicts. Study it out. Any contradiction people tell you, I remember I got this list of contradictions, so I went through them tediously for a year and showed this guy why they weren't contradictions, and he looked at it and said, eh. But he wouldn't even study it because he just wanted an excuse. But understand that. Not only that, scientific accuracy in some of the things that were foretold. The Bible told us the earth was round, and I'm sorry if you're a flat earther. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you can still fellowship here. Um, but the Bible says it's an orb, okay? It told us that before we ever realized it was round and it floated in space and all of these things. There are several things like that in the scripture. The other thing that's really curious about the scripture, it doesn't hide the warts. It tells about the weaknesses of people. If you were going to create a book or make a book up, you wouldn't do that. It, it tells us the truth of people we admire, people like King David, Samson, these people who failed miserably. God doesn't hide that. The other thing is, is this. The persecution of the early church, they held to the word. They never denied it. They were persecuted to death, which we're going to find out. And they never deni denied the word. But two of the most powerful, I think, evidences for the Holy Scripture is this. I know what it's done in my own life. I know it has power. It's alive, as we're going to find out in Hebrews chapter 4. It's living. It's God-breathed. It has changed my life. It's changed your life. If you've studied the Word, if you read the Word, if you apply those things to your life, the power of the Word is so powerful that it changes you from the inside out. I know that. It's changed me. And then the last thing on the list, the most important, Jesus declared that it all speaks of him. The King of the universe, my Lord and Savior, your King, my King, said it all speaks of him, and he declared it was true. That right there is enough. But there's so much evidence to back up what the Word of God is. But what do they do? What do they do in this day? The same thing Lucifer did. Has God really said? This is the lie. Lucifer, what did he say to Eve in the garden? Has God really said? And what's the other thing? You won't surely die. In fact, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. I want to start with Genesis 3.1 from the Amplified Translation of the Bible. Because look, this is the lie Satan gave Eve, and it's the same lie we see in society today. Now the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Oh, he's subtle and crafty. This is talking about that passive, aggressive, evil behavior. I just have to tell you, if you do that, stop. Passive-aggressive behavior is satanic. Do you understand that? So many people hold to this, and I just will tell you, you'll never be able to be used in ministry if you're passive-aggressive, if you're subtle in this, this kind of thing. This is what Satan does. He does these passive-aggressive, subtle things. Not only that, what does he do? He manipulates. Don't manipulate. Don't manipulate. Whenever we manipulate or we're passive aggressive or we're holding on to that juicy little nugget of gossip that we love to share just to cause problems in someone else's life, that's Satan. You want to be used by God? You want to be used in ministry? You want to have a healthy household? Get this junk out of your life because you're just acting like the devil. I'm just acting like the devil if I do these things. It's evil. But notice, the first thing Satan does is sow seeds of doubt about God's word. He wanted Eve not to trust the word of God. Again, that first part says, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? Has God really said, you know, the serpent? That's what he did. Sowing seeds of doubt about God's word. That's the inference. And then he piles on in verse 4 and 5 after Eve defends it. He says this, but the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. See what he did? A half truth. He's right. On the day she eats it, she won't die, but she'll begin to die. And spiritually, she'll die. He didn't tell her that. This is what happens. Subtle manipulation. Can you really trust the word of God? This is what we see in the world today. Can you really trust the word of God? But notice this, he followed it up with man's greatest desire and his greatest desire. Satan's greatest desire is to be like God. And he tells us this lie. Do you understand what he's saying? You don't have to trust the word of God. He's just keeping you down with it. You're going to be like God. In essence, you're going to be your own God. You're going to be a God. And there are whole religions that teach this. Whole religions that say, 
the Bible is not true. It's only true if it's translated correctly and by our prophets, by our people. Our holy book is correct. And guess what? You can become a god. Just think about that. It's exactly the same thing. But it's not just in the cults. It's also in our Christianity, quote-unquote. You have whole religions out there or whole groups out there that call themselves Christians that say they're little gods and that they could speak things into existence. They could just name it and claim it. It's the same heresy, same side, or same coin, different side. And then ultimately, think about the world today. Think about the condition. Think about the Antichrist system that's building. They want transhumanism. They think they're going to live forever. They think they're going to be gods. That's what they're saying publicly now. The oligarchs, all these powerful people with all their wealth, they think they're going to live forever through technology. And that old, outdated book, has God really said, there's no God. All you, you know, right-wing wackos who hold to the scripture, <laughs> it's not true. But we see that all over the place. In essence, that's what they claim, that that's not what really scripture says. That's not true. They think they know the, and a lot of people in the cults and in Christianity think they know what the Bible says. You don't, and I don't. Those who take it literal, those who study it through, line by line, chapter upon chapter. We don't really know. It's them who have a special understanding of Scripture. Just ask them. But understand the Word of God is special. I wanted to re restate this this week because I think it's so crucial in the days we live. And the Bible can be trusted. The Bible is God-breathed. And know this, God is big enough and, more, and powerful enough to protect his Bible, to protect his word. If he is who he says he is, Genesis 1.1, if he is who he says he is, he can protect the Bible. He can, and he has. And we're going to find out, as we go through the book of Hebrews, again, in chapter 4, we're going to find out this word, this book, is alive. It's living and active. It reveals some amazing things, and it destroys heresy and fleshly desires and false teachings. And I want to end on this before we dive into our passage today. The thing is, is the Bible declares two amazing truths. If you'll hold them, if you'll look at them, if you'll really accept them, two amazing, powerful truths. Are you ready? One, there is a God. And two, you're not him. <laughs> and I might add, and you never will be. But speaking of God, last week we looked at what the scripture says about who Jesus really is. Of course, he's Messiah, but he's God in the flesh. He, would, he came and dwelled among us. That's what Emmanuel means. God in the flesh, the creator of the universe, came and walked among us. And through the incarnation, we looked at all of that. He allowed himself to become lower than the angels, to become a man, to pay for the sins of mankind. And last week we looked at all of that. We won't go into back into that, but we saw how far superior he was to the angels. Because he created them. He is their creator, and so he's far superior. And even though we know the Jewish people revered and feared angels, they are now taking this in, as I believe it's Paul writing it, they're taking it in that Jesus is far above the angels. He created the angels, and that was a powerful statement. And so today, as we finish chapter 1, we're going to continue to see that comparison. Last week, we covered chapter, or verse 5. I'm going to start with verse 5 for context. I'm going to read through verse 9, and then we'll dive in. Hebrews 1, 5 through 9. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And, the, and of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministering or in his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And Lord, this is your word. We believe it's your word. And God, even if we don't believe it, Lord, prove your word in this way. You say that your word will not return void. So let it go deep into the hearts of every person here, Lord. Let our eyes be opened, our ears be opened. Let us hear what you have to say and let us apply what it is you want us to do. God, we praise you and we honor you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so last week we looked at that term begotten there in verse 5. 
But today we're going to look at a related term, but different. Firstborn in verse 6. Begotten, remember I told you, many people hold on to that term and they try to say this proves that Jesus is a created being because he was begotten. But we talked about the incarnation. It's, there's, that's not nonsense. And today when we look at this term firstborn, they use the same term to say, see, he's created because he was the firstborn. But they don't understand the scripture. They don't know how to apply it. The thing is, is this does not say that Jesus is created. Firstborn is a title. Just as begotten, we looked at all of that, is a title. It means Jesus is eternal. But the firstborn, this application, it's not talking about physically born. It's a spiritual title. It means preeminence or priority blessing. And to explain this, I want us to look at Jeremiah 31.9. Because this is a prophecy of God. This is a prophecy about Israel, bringing them back into the nation. But then God says something powerful in this verse. Jeremiah 31, 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn. And you might say, okay, <laughs> what does that even mean? I don't know. Let's move. No, I'm just So here's the thing. Here's what we see. God is proclaiming something profound. Number one, that God would bring Israel back in the land. We know he's done that more than once. But he's declaring that Ephraim is his firstborn, which if you know anything about Ephraim and Manasseh, they were the sons of Joseph. Manasseh was the firstborn physically. Ephraim was not firstborn. But do you remember the story in Genesis 48? Remember when Joseph brought his sons to Jacob as he was dying? Jacob is also Israel. As he's dying, he's going to give a blessing to the sons of Joseph. He brings them in, and Joseph, he, he thinks he's doing the right thing. He brings Manasseh in, puts him at the right hand of Jacob, and takes Ephraim and puts him at the left hand, hand of Jacob. But Jacob does something powerful. It's prophetic. He crosses his hands. He places the right hand of blessing on Ephraim. And in Genesis 48, 17 through 19, we read, even though Joseph was not having any of it, look at what it says. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his, father, his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, No, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He shall, or also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Now, when you really understand what's being said here prophetically, this is pointing to Yeshua. This is pointing to Christ. Something beautiful is happening here. Because the firstborn is no longer the preeminent one with the priority blessing. It's the second. You know, we saw the same thing with Isaac and Ishmael. We saw the same thing with Jacob and Esau. In Genesis 22, when Abraham was told by God to take Isaac and sacrifice him, we know all that whole chapter is pointing to Jesus, but what did God say to Abraham? In Genesis 22, verse 2, he says this, Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac. Well, wait a second. What about Ishmael? Ishmael was the firstborn. Ishmael was the firstborn son, remember? Because Abraham and Sarah wanted to get ahead of God. Hey, take my handmaiden, Hagar, and have a child. We'll just help God out. So he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God saw Isaac as the promised child, as the firstborn, as the preeminent one. Why? Because Ishmael was the work of the flesh. Ishmael was the work of the flesh, but Isaac was the work of the spirit. Isaac was the son of promise, one of works, one of faith, one of flesh, one of spirit. That's what's going on here. And we know the same thing happened with Jacob and Esau. Now Esau sold his own birthright for some stew. He was just a very fleshly human being. But then we know Jacob, you know, Mr. Conniver and his mama, you know, they come up with this plan and they get it switched too. They get the priority blessing upon him. And so we know that same thing is said. But here's what it's all pointing to. It's pointing to the first Adam and the last Adam. It's pointing to Adam who failed in the flesh, who failed in his works, and the last Adam who's Jesus Christ, who is the promised one of the Spirit, 
who is the promised one of faith. He is the preeminent one. He is the one with the priority blessing. That's why Colossians 1.15 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It's a title. In Romans 8.29, which is an often skewed passage, but people, if they just read it in context, Romans 8.29 says this, For whom he foreknew, speaking of Christ, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And this is where we get involved. I told you last week, we were not the sons and daughters of God. We were at enmity. But through the power of Christ, we can become sons of God. We can become the brethren, brothers of Christ. That's what it's saying here. But Jesus Christ is the one with the priority blessing. He is the preeminent one. He qualifies as the only son of the Father. And through him, all of us are blessed. It's through him that we receive that blessing as well as the family, as the sons and daughters of God. And in this way, he is the firstborn. Again, it's a position. It's a priority blessing. He's the preeminent one. It has nothing to do with him being a created being. Period. The end. And we know this. God has no creator. And we know. We've seen passage after passage that tells us Jesus Christ is the creator. But notice this, what it also says in verse 6, because this is exciting for us. Verse 6 there in Hebrews 1, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Do you realize what this is referring to? When he again brings, when he again brings the firstborn into the world. This is speaking of his second coming. What a beautiful promise for you and me. You know, as, as the world challenges us, if, if you're having a really bad day, it's a lot easier to accept this kind of thing, but I just can't wait until we return with the Lord. Remember, he comes once for his church. We meet him in the clouds. He doesn't return at that point. He takes us in the rapture. Then we return with him in victory formation. You know, I love, I love the game of football, and I just love victory formation when it's your team. When it's your team, you just take a knee. Well, this isn't, this isn't like that. What's going to happen is the Lord's just going to come and destroy every, every evil person, every one of those people on Team Antichrist in a moment with his word but we get to be there with him. It's almost like we get to act like we're part, you know, we're, we're part of this. We're actually doing something. No, we're just spectators. But we're following our king. But when he again brings him into the world, this firstborn one, this one who is preeminent, imagine how beautiful that will be. I can't wait. I can't wait. I love Jeremiah 3.17 says this, At that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No, no more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. A day is coming when all sin is going to be wiped away. When you and I will have brand new bodies that have never, ever sinned and never will sin. They won't hurt and ache. <laughs> And we're going to see more of this comparison in verse 7, showing the superiority of Christ to angels. Verse 7 says, And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? And understand this too. In chapter 1 in Hebrews, there are seven direct quotes from the Psalms. There's, well, and actually just from the Old Testament itself. But six of them are related to the Davidic covenant. And I won't go into that today because we have a section we'll do later. But six of them are directly related to the Davidic covenant. Easy for me to say. And, but this one, this is a quote from Psalm 104.4. And what this is talking about is the, that the angels themselves are, are creation of God. And it's telling us who they belong to. Notice it says they are his ministers. This is speaking of Jesus. The angels belong to him. He created them. They belong to him. That's what this is saying. And they are uh, his instrument, which means ministers. They belong to him and they do his work. And that, that word uh, minister also means servant. Servant or minister. And they're doing his work. And how? As a flame of fire. And again, we'll cover that later. But I think you know the stories of how God uses angels. But as we're going to see today, he also uses them for our benefit, to protect us to help each one of us. Each one of us has angels if we're truly a Christian. And I'll show you that. But again, for those who say Jesus is not God, or he's one of many gods, or something along those lines, they don't like this verse, but they really don't like, like the next two verses. Look at verse 8 and 9. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. 
is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. This is from Psalm 45, verse 6 and 7. What I love about this is in Psalms, we don't get the understanding that this is being said to the Son. But here we get the translation. We understand this is speaking to Jesus. And let me read it from Psalm 45. Because look at the powerful, look at these verses and what it's really saying. There's a beautiful picture of the entire Trinity in this passage. Your throne, speaking to Jesus, the Son. Oh God, <laughs> right there, declares Jesus is God, is forever and ever. I think it was Pastor Chris was talking about this. It's not just forever, it's forever and ever. It's not just forever, it's eternal. His throne is forever. So every day you can look, and yes, the throne of heaven is still set. Jesus is on it. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of whose kingdom? Your kingdom. Speaking of the Lord, speaking of Jesus, your, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Now look at this. Therefore, God, this is what's being said. He's addressing God. Therefore, God, your God. This is the Son being spoken to about the Father. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And here's a beautiful thing. In Scripture, in the Old Testament especially, when you look at uh, oil, it's a picture and type of the Holy Spirit. And so when you really analyze this, if you have eyes to see, you see the Father, you see the Son, you see the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful thing. And, and I didn't plan on this, but one of my favorite passages of Scripture about the Trinity is Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11. I've talked about this before. When you go study out Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11, it talks about the triune nature of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living within the human being. For you're not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, for the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit's in life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your immortal body through the Spirit that dwells in you. And you go study that out. It is the Father, it's the Son, it's the Holy Spirit, Spirit dwelling within humankind, dwelling within the human being. Such a powerful thing when you realize the triune God lives within us through the power of his Holy Spirit. I don't fully understand it. And no, the Holy Spirit is distinct. Jesus the Son is distinct. The Father is distinct. They are not each other, but they are one God. Trip on that for a minute. Again, it'll bake your noodle. There's no way this side of heaven we are ever going to understand. We have to receive it in faith. Sorry, a little rabbit trail, huh? But when people try to deny the Trinity, I just, I don't understand. I, I do. I do, because they want to figure things out. They want to know. They want to be smarter than everyone else. And in their pride, they want to be that person who just understands or has special knowledge. But I've heard everybody, I've heard so many people squirm with these passages and try to twist them to their own folly. But the word is being manipulated and twisted all day long now. You know, it, it was bad before. I have never seen anything like I've seen it in the last few years. Guys, it's, it's really getting bad. And you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3 gives us symptoms of the very last generation. You want to know how we know we're living in the last days? Number one, Hebrews told us that <laughs> since Christ is the last days. But we know we're getting close. We might even be living in the time of the beginning of sorrows that Jesus talked about. Because look at this. Look at some of the symptoms of the last generation. But know this, verse 1 in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Oh, I'm glad we don't see this. <laughs> I often joke, we are the ones who created the selfie. Just let that sink in. <laughs> lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong and haughty. Haughty means high-minded. They think they are better and smarter than everyone else. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You want to know where the name it and claim it and all these heresies come from? Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And look at this, having a form of godliness, how many of them claim to be believers of some type? But denying its power. And from such, hang out with them and make sure they're your best friends. Is that what the scripture says? From such people, turn away. 
Don't be unequally yoked, Christian, especially in the dating scene. I've talked about this before. Be careful who you invite to your life. You want to reach them for the gospel? That's great. But you keep that relationship at a distance that's safe. Do not be unequally yoked. Verse 6, for this of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. And notice this, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This generation is so smart, just ask them. Just ask them. And here's the thing, I'm not talking about the younger people. I'm talking about the generation that's alive today. Young, old, everything in between. This doesn't let any group off the hook. This generation, the ones who live today, part of the problem is, you know, the internet and everything that we have at our fingertips. So much information. I could just Google it. I must be smart. I can Google. Could you imagine if all that went down for about a month? Oh, I would love it. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. No, I, you know, I would. If for nothing else, I mean, some of these people would be humbled and realize they don't know squat. I think that's the King James Version. I try, you know, I try to be biblical. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't even know what that word is in the Greek, but I can find out. <laughs> the thing is, is it's, it's so amazing how many self-proclaimed scholars I meet these days. Many of us, we spend our whole lives studying the Word, diving into the Word, and then, you know, this person who, ah, well, on the Internet, it says this. Okay, well... Have you tested that with the scripture? Have you studied that and prayed about that? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to you on that? They're so smart. It's actually really sad. And like I said, it's old, it's young, it's everything in between. And they don't realize that all their knowledge, all their information is worthless because there's no wisdom. Information is just information. You can have all the information and all that knowledge, but if you don't have wisdom, you don't have anything. You need wisdom. And they don't even realize that they're blind. And their blindness is sent from the enemy. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Isn't that sad? Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. When you think, man, has everyone gone nuts? Yes. Yes. This is why when we look at the political world, you know, vote. Run for office. Do all of those things. We need to infiltrate. We need to do those things. We need to take back those things that are ours. We need to stand up for those kids. We need to do all of those things. But if you truly want change in a nation, it takes heart change. So preach the gospel. Let's get people saved. Then they vote the right way all the time. But right now, many of them are blinded. The God of this age has blinded them who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. How sad is that? They're blind. They're so blind they can't even see the light of Christ. They just don't realize that unless they have the spirit of Christ within them, they'll never be able to understand the truth. They'll never be able to see it. This is why I don't argue with people in their fallen state. I'll talk to them a little bit, but I stop arguing. I go right to the heart of the matter, the gospel. I start to appeal to the conscience. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever lusted? Have you ever blasphemed? You know, if you stand in front of God on Judgment Day, you're going to be held guilty. And he says if you've sinned one time, he's going to send you to a real place called hell. They don't like this. But it goes right to the conscience, and you should see how it cuts out all those other arguments immediately. You see, they have to get saved before they can be changed. Discipline can do it a little bit in your flesh, but not true change. It only comes through the power of the gospel. When a person is truly born again and the Spirit of Christ is placed in them, that is the moment that their heart gets changed and that their mind gets changed and they become different. And in the book of Ephesians, we see this. Ephesians 1, as Paul is writing this prayer to these believers in Ephesus, uh, or chapter 1, verse 15 through 19 says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints... Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what this generation needs. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's how you overcome the darkness. That's how you overcome the blindness. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. 
What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? I don't have time to go on with this, but do you see what it's saying? In him there's hope. And Christian, in him there's an inheritance you can't even fathom. We have no idea, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Nobody can imagine what's waiting for us who love him. We have an inheritance that's beyond anything you could ever, ever imagine. And when you have something so, you know, let's bring it to a practical model here. You know when you find that really awesome restaurant? <laughs> Maybe you don't want to share it because you don't want it to get busy. But, or if you find some cool thing, don't you just want to share it? Like you want to share it with your friends and family if you find something really awesome, really amazing. You know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. So why is it us Christians who, who know We've been saved from the fires of hell that we have an eternal inheritance that's beyond anything we can imagine or think. We've won the lottery a million times over. We're royalty. We're going to live with the king of the universe forever and rule and reign. So why is it we can't talk about it? We should be those who never shut up about it. There's so many things in this room, many of you never shut up about other things. You're just always talking about some subject, right? <laughs> Am I offending people today? I don't know. Whatever your hobby, whatever you're obsessed, but what about Jesus? What about your inheritance? What about who you are in him? When's the last time you actually opened your mouth and said that to somebody? I am not coming back to this church. <laughs> we, we came to visit. Weather's good. I'm going to lunch. Yeah. But it's so true, folks. And I say it in love. We all need to do a better job. What an inheritance we have. What a hope we have. But we can't have godly wisdom or understand what the word says without the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. But know this, this is the sad and frightening thing. Those individuals who are blinded by the enemy, it's willing, blindness. They will not be held without excuse. Look at this, Romans 1, 20 through 22, it tells us, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Does that not sum up our generation? Here's the thing. It's heartbreaking. You know, that word for fools is moraino. <laughs> and it means foolish or simpleton. It comes from the word moros, but it means stupid, absurd, or I kid you not, a blockhead. That's what it means in the Greek. I'm not kidding. Go look it up. But that word moros is where our, we get our English word moron. And what's crazy, it's funny, right? But it's so sad. Because they're, they're the same ones who call us morons for believing the scripture. The very thing that gives us life, that tells us about Jesus, the very thing that changes us, that gives us the gospel. We are born again. We are going to escape the wrath that's coming. All creation is going to be wiped out one day. It's all going to burn. Yet this is what they hold to. They hold on tightly to this world. And remember what I told you before. This is their heaven. This is the best it's ever going to be for the lost. It's the worst it's ever going to be for you and me. But they're without excuse. The enemy has blinded them, but it was with their own permission and their own volition. They want to be blinded because they like their evil deeds. And we see in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, we're going to see about the destruction of what's coming, about the foundation and the destruction. Verse 10, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. And we know that is true. But I want to also be reminded, this is, that's a passage from Psalm 102. But I want to read a passage from Isaiah. Isaiah 45, 12 de declares the same thing in reference to God. And then in verse 18, we see something else that I want to uh, stand on today and make sure that we hold true. Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There's no other God. In verse 5 of that same chapter, we read, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. There is one God in three persons. 
the triune nature of God, the Trinity that you have to understand and accept by faith. And there's so many heresies out there. I don't have time. Maybe when we, we go a little further, you know, there's modalism. There's a, an Arianism. A modalism says he changes modes. Arianism says he's, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are created. There's partialism where they're one-third God. There's polytheism that many of the cults believe. None of it is true. It's all heresy. It cannot be understood in our feeble little minds. The triune nature of God. Three distinct persons, one God. The Shema. Israel doesn't even realize. They, every day they say the Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. Echad is a perfect word because it means one. It means a unity. The three names, three names of God, and it's actually Yahavah, Eloheinu, Yahavah, Echad. Perfect unity. It's the triune God in declaration. In the beginning, he said, let us create man in our image. Who's he talking to? We won't fully understand the Trinity. It's okay. Accept it in faith and realize that's the God we worship, the one we can't fully understand, the one that makes us fall at his feet and say, God, I'm in awe of you. But all these things that these people hold dear, all of these things that they're holding on to, look at verses 11 and 12. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up and they will be changed, but you are the same and your years will not fail. That's another quote from Psalm 102. And I love Malachi 3.6 because it's in the same vein. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. And we'll get into the fact that God is not done with Israel as we get into the book of Hebrews. But that's part of God's promise that he doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And be thankful that that is true. Could you imagine trying to worship one of these gods that are created, that these people make up, that can get in a bad mood? Oh, uh, I've made God probably in some kind of a bad mood if he's even available to do that. But I'm just telling you, I don't want to serve a God that could just one day zap me because, you know, he, he has a temper tantrum. He doesn't change, thank God. But then 13 and 14, the last part of chapter 1, is beautiful because it, it ends with powerful proclamation but also a personal promise. Look at this. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? That's speaking of you and me. But look at what this is saying. Sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. That's speaking of when Christ returns. When Christ returns... And we know he's going to set up his throne. He's going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split in two. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, and we're going to rule and reign with him as glorified ones. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Are they not all ministering spirits set forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? That's talking about you and me, the angels right now in this room. They're in this room. They're with you, believer. You have an angel or two or three, or some of you probably have more than that. But you have angels who minister to you, who help you. If you are those who will inherit salvation, and you might say, well, wait a second, I already have salvation. Well, this is speaking of that glorified inheritance. You were saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved. Think about this. Remember on the cross, Jesus paid for our sins. We were justified. And I love that term, just as if I'd never sinned. We were justified. We've been sanctified, set apart for his use, and one day we'll be glorified. When we see him, we'll be like him. That's the beautiful thing, and that's what it's saying here. That's what it's saying. It's a powerful statement because you and I are joint heirs with Christ. When we get into our inheritance and what it really means, we'll cover some of this, but when you realize you're a joint heir with Jesus, do you really understand what that means? Chew on that this week. Meditate on that. Romans eight sixteen through 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So when life gets tough, just know it's part of the game. It's part of the process. Receive it. Let God have his way, whatever that is, in your life. 
And just remember that one day we will be like him and we will be with him. The God of the universe, the one that created all things, the one who is the son, he's the only begotten son. He's the firstborn over all creation. Those are his beautiful titles, but he's the creator of all. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's coming again soon to get us. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for this beautiful truth, Lord, that we are yours and we belong to you. And that, Lord, one day we will enter that kingdom and when we see Jesus, we will be like him and we will be heirs of this promise. We don't deserve it. This is why songs are written about grace, Lord. You are incredible. Why would you do this for us? Who is man that you're mindful of us? Why would you take this sinful being, all of us, Lord, collectively, all of our sin, why would you do this for us? Well, we know from Scripture it's because you love us. And because of that, we can love you. And so thank you, Lord, and we praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.